today we're probably going to do something that was, in my opinion, a little overdue and have a class about one of the best chess players of all time, Alexander Ale... It's called Aliokhin, and you will say Alekhin, okay, whatever you want to pronounce it. I find him to be one of the more original players of all time. Very exciting chess player. Sometimes he was really like devil may care, happy-go-lucky in the opening, as you will see at least once or twice here today. And um, nonetheless, he was very original in his thinking and very, very impressive. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to see two different positions where I hope that I can prove to you that uh, the ordinary player would have chosen one route, but he chose a completely different route. And then we will see two games where he just shows his mastery in planning. So let's start with this example from his game against Akiva Rubinstein, the same, the same one that we saw in the previous lecture that uh, was not recorded. In that game, Akiva Rubinstein beat someone very impressively. We see an, a position that looks a little funny. Like when I'm looking at this position, it looks to me like I, I want to hit myself in the back of the head so the things will straighten out. Normally you have this position where like this knight might be here and this bishop might be on f4. If the knight is here and the bishop here, then I have a semi-normal position. But something went bizarre and the bishop is on a very strange square and the knight on g6, really strange, right? So now it's right to move. Now, I will bet anyone, when I say original player and playing, thinking out of the box, then of course it's much harder to solve or think of the moves. But when I show this position to my students without any ceremonies, without any announcements, and I ask them, okay, why to move? What would you play here? So they think, and I don't care if they are 1200 or 2200, they look at this position and they come up with different plans. And the plans they come up with usually range between rook ac1, trying to take advantage of the unprotected knight on c6. Okay, not a tragic move. Pawn a3, sometimes you hear that, they say, oh, the bishop on f8 might want to pin my knight on, on b4. I don't agree, but it's a move. And of course, the main suggestion, the one that gets the most points, and I bet that some of you might be thinking, is g3, bishop g2, castles, because if I have to move the silly move bishop on e3, it's going to be a hassle. Some people get evolved and say, well, how about if I play bishop g5, move it from an odd spot, if the queen moves, I'll play e3. If the bishop goes to e7, I'll trade bishops, then e3, bishop d3, castles, and life is not so bad. So all of these moves make, make some sense. Listen, you can't say, oh, you just suggested an absurd move. No. Everything is just really cool. But Aliokhin in this position decided to play a little differently. And note, notice the plan that he plays. I'm going to show you how it's done, but it's really nice to see as some sort of a... Um, how to put it, some sort of a, a, a symphony, like it's, when, it, when it's done in harmony, in harmony of a bunch of moves together. However, he played h4, straight up, immediately saying, hey, the knight on g6 is a funny knight, and I'm going to take advantage of it. Also, I have, he says to himself, I have chances to take advantage of the dark squares, and I'm going to make the maximum. Okay, his opponent is not exactly a potter, he's at Akiva Rubinstein, he's a grandmaster level player. So he plays bishop d6. He realizes that in one second I'm going to go h5, and this knight is going to have to go back blocking my bishop. How on earth I'm going to develop this bishop later, who knows? Of course, I move like h5, it's just going to bring a smile to the face because it's very easy for me to defend h4 by playing g3 at the right moment, but h5 is going to be a real target at some, at some moment. Like, even if, let's say, if you play h5, and I'm going to play even a move like bishop g5, whether we trade bishops or not. At some point later, I'm going to play e3. My knight will move maybe to e5 or g5, and my queen, especially with a bishop on e2, this pawn is going to suffer a lot. And of course, he won't be able to castle like a normal person. So he played bishop d6, a move that makes sense. h5, we continue with our plan. Forward, okay, knight e7. What else can we suggest? Again, the most normal of moves, and that pawn is not done yet, the h pawn express advantage, advances to h6. <coughs> of course, I'm just threatening h takes g7. If you take and I take, that's awesome. So he plays g6. So in the tra within three moves, we are seeing a beautiful transformation. The black king said looks a little like the dark squares are not happy. 
and white continues in the same spirit. Bishop g5, that bishop that looked really clumsy on e3 is now conquering another beautiful diagonal. Beautiful play by al -Yohan. Now, my intention is to put it on f6 and it's going to be hard to stop. So, castles, sooner or later you have to. If you played another move and I played bishop f6 attacking your rook, you're not going to move your rook, right? You have to castle. So, castles, bishop f6. What a beautiful plan by white, so original. Out of nowhere, a position that's like dormant and sleepy, most players would have played g3 or rook c1, never to see this game again, unless you find it in some old notebook. And this game, look, what's, look how the game continues. All of a sudden, black becomes really nervous because he thinks, wait a minute, I'm not going to get e5 easily at all. Even if I do, all my positions are going to be weak. What am I going to do about bishop c8? I don't know. Or am I going to develop that? So he is playing b5, trying to get some initiative on the queen side. And again, I'll say it one more time. Remember who is playing with the black pieces. A world-class player. One of the strongest of the era. And watch how, how he's struggling against Aljokin. I'm not saying this is a great move because it's create new, creating new weaknesses. And watch how beautifully he takes advantage of them. But it's really, it's already the position is a little unpleasant to play. I'm not saying it's lost but it's already becoming a bit uncomfortable. So, b5, e3, obviously, bishop d7. Again, bishop b7 makes even less sense because you're just biting on granite, just looking at your pawns. Here, at least, maybe you have some hope later on moving to the queen side. So, bishop d3, the last minor goes into the game. Rook c8. Those last moves, I think they're very trivial. I think that there's just, any club players might have chosen them as well. Now, a4 comes. Excellent. Immediately tickling the pawn on b5, creating a crisis. Now what to do? Of course, black doesn't want to take because then pawn a6 is just dead. And then pawn a4 is going to die right after it. Basically losing a pawn taking. You can't protect it enough. There's no way to protect it enough times because it's already attacked three times, defended only once. So what the he what heck are we going to do? He's got to advance it. And he does. B4 was played. Now it's our turn. What are we going to do with the knight? Again, this is what we talk about really good planning in chess. Take your knight in your imaginary hand and think, what is my final destination for it? Where am I going to end up with this knight? What am I going to do with this knight? Watch what he does. Knight e2, yeah, that in itself is not very hard, but do you see the final stop? Let's see. Queen b6, and now knight c1. Some of you might say, wait a minute, this knight is going to f4 or g3? No. No, this is a dead end. I'm not going to mate this king right now. But the, weak, the queen side is rich with weaknesses. So knight c1. Now the knight wants to land on b3. I can tell you, but of course I'm cheating because I've seen this game all the way to its end, to its very miserable end for black. If I was black here, I would play b3. You want to take my pawn, take my pawn, enjoy, do whatever, do your worst. I want to give you the pawn just so I have some breathing space. Once the white knight gets to b3 without the pawn advancing there, black is having no fun whatsoever. <coughs> so I would have played b3. Still, it's a very pleasant choice, but I can either take or not take. You know, take at the right time, do whatever I want. Beautiful position for white. So anyways, rook c7, trying to double rooks on the c file. Knight to b3. Beautiful. Knight a5. Again, the knight on b3 is becoming very pestish, very annoying. For example, one idea I have is to play a5 myself. If I go a5, then guess what? The poor lady is going to have to defend this, babysit this pawn forever. I have a bishop here attacking it. If I'm going to get a5 in and the queen moves, then I'm going to go queen e2. <coughs> and black, black is going to have to dedicate lots of pieces to defending that weakness forever. Very poor position. So he doesn't want to allow it, and he also wants to trade knights. And white immediately plays based on the tactics. Knight c5. Maybe Rubinstein thought that that move was impossible in this maneuvering. Maybe he miscalculated, but now he's facing a crisis. Very, very bad. Now, what to do? In the game he played knight c4. 
if he would have taken it, and I take it, queen takes, of course you cannot take with the rook, your knight on e7 is hanging. If you take it, I'm going to go bishop d4. You have a very easy move because it's your only one. Queen, queen to c6, if you go queen d6, I'm going to go here. Bye bye exchange. And I'm killing you on the c file. So he had to play queen c6, and now knight e5, knight g4, game over. Threatening bishop e5, threatening knight f6, threatening bishop g7 and knight f6, and this dark square just looks like some Swiss cheese, right? Completely game over. Yeah, so very difficult situation. So knight on c5, he has to swallow that frog and tolerate it. He tries knight c4. Again, trying to get some counterplay. However, this is already calculated. First of all, we eliminate that little thing. No need to have that. Must take back. And he played the move knight e5. Not bad, but maybe the move knight e4 would have been even more annoying. Because now you're not moving almost anything. Like really bad. Like one idea I have, knight takes d6, queen takes d6. The aforementioned bishop e5. Winning the material, and great. A second idea, yeah, bishop to g7. Attacking the rook. If the rook wants to move, knight f6 check. And for those of you who play bug house, this is a very familiar situation. The bug houses in the back are cheering, yes. Absolutely. Hard, hard to not think about it in, the bug house, in bug house terms. Because how often do you see pawn h6, bishop g7, and the knight coming to f6. So this would have been an even better move, probably, after the take, to go knight e4. He plays knight e5. Not exactly a losing move, if, and if you use an understatement. Beautiful, just tremendous. Now, the bishop on d7 is threatened, everything, everything is threatened. Pawn c4 is threatened, and again, if I get to take on c4, it's like a domino. Takes, takes, bishop e5, takes, it's like everything falls apart. So he played bishop takes e5 very reluctantly. Bishop takes e7, clearly the best move. Bishop d6, yeah, what else? Already he is in real deep trouble. If he goes rook e8 to try to save his exchange, then probably taking bishop here and something, something is going to fall. I don't know if this is the only plan, but this is one good plan. So, miserable position, really a terrible position. He decides to suffer this way, but after takes, 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 a5, Queen f3, <coughs> Aliokin had no problems winning the ending. For the record, we'll see the rest of the game. Rook d5, rook c1, queen moves away. The pawn fell. Okay, one trick, if rook takes c3, bishop b4 is winning, but no. Here, king e2. Not notice how solid the white position is. He's up in exchange. The king feels totally safe on the light squares. White has no, black has nothing to attack the light squares. Queen here. No. F5. Rook B1. Already threatening sacrifices. The queen moves. Queen C4. Improving. Again, just simple play, just beautiful, simple play. Creating a pass pawn and pushing it and pushing it. And this was, I don't know if that was a joke or a serious move, but checkmate. Because after here, oh, the volume is off because the machine says checkmate. So beautiful performance. Again, from a starting position that looks so naive, so, so simple, he managed to create something that makes a mess out of it, gets an advantage, and wins. Now, to our second game, our second position. Now, if you thought that the first one was really simple, this is one heck of a mess. Yeah, I think I showed it to somebody in this class in one of our lessons, this position. Really, really a messy position. Take a good look. I'll let you adjust to it because what is going on? It's white to move, and it looks like he can take a whole piece, which is really great. And 
However, he has some problems. He has some real serious issues. Mainly, the black king is castled, and the white king is stuck in the center. And black is threatening the famous mouse trap of c4, trapping this bishop. So yeah, a very, very difficult situation. What to do with white? Let's check some of the possibilities and see how they just don't work out. For example, say you take this guy. Then I'm going to go rook e8 check. Good luck with what you want to do. King somewhere, I don't know, king f2 maybe? Or king f1, OK, the, the suggestion is king f1. Let's do king f1. And then c4. So basically, black is getting his piece back. And it's very easy to understand <coughs> in this position how the bishop on b7 is going to be a monster bishop on the long diagonal, while this bishop on c1 is like an orphan, still trying to find some, some pasture to, to operate on. So this, from White's point of view, is just complete gloom. I think the computer says something like minus one or two or something, like really bad. So that's out. Maybe we can play something like, how about c4? Looks like a really nice move, preventing the mousetrap and still attacking the knight. But in this position, black has a monster move. A real beautiful response. Again, taking advantage of the king in the center. d5. What a shot. Just uh, To me, this is like a, a real beautiful move. Now, again, just threatening to trap the bishop. If you take the knight, same story. Rook check. The poor king has to move. Pawn takes pawn. I'm regaining my piece. And again, I'm going to end up with an awesome light square bishop against this thing on c1 that is just a little bit lost. That's out. OK, other tries. Bishop d5, trying to save the bishop by moving it. But then, again, black has a very simple answer. Takes, getting rid of the attack piece. Takes, attacking the rook. And now simply, queen b6, a beautiful developing move with the idea of playing bishop b7 on the long diagonal. What a monster position. This bishop is just murder. It's a murderous bishop. And this bishop is just very clumsy. Of course, if you take the rook, just bishop b7, and you're going to have to give up your queen for the other rook. But then the queen and the bishop on the long diagonal is just no match for those rooks who are just not in the game. There are no open files for them right now. And they're not even close to open files. So of course, the queen is 10 times better than the rooks. That, is, that variation is also out. And lastly, uh, if castles trying to keep the king safe, then after c4, pawn takes, queen takes, <coughs> the bishop is still lost on b3, so we didn't lose a piece. We're going to get it back. And for the umpteen time, eventually, after the rook moves or whatever, the bishop is going to come to the diagonal. And again, this bishop is much better than c1. This position is not looking very fun for white, right? Again, typical for Aliokin's happy-go-lucky style in the opening. What to do? Watch, what he, what the, watch the imagination. He plays a move. Black plays a move. And it looks like he just made matters worse. But actually, no. A4. Look. What's that? A4. I said A4. A4. He could play A4. But imagine, if I go something like C4, you move your bishop, and I move my knight at some point. I mean. Really, really bad. And again, remember, I can play bishop to b7 at any moment. The king in the center is just dying. What he does is just unfathomable. I think if I gave you lots of guesses, anybody who hasn't seen the game is going to have a really hard time. So he plays bishop a3. OK, a move that makes sense. Now it's not so simple to play a move like c4, because a, I'm going to take your rook on f8 the one that was hoping to check. Then I'm going to take the knight on f6. Right? So if c4, I can just take here, then take here. That's great. So that takes care of that. On the other hand, I'm developing my bishop, and I'm ready to take your pawn for free, hitting the rook. And I'm ready to castle. And I'm ready to take this knight later on. So at first you're saying, wow, white found a solution. But black plays queen a5. Now he's attacking that bishop. And if that bishop was hoping to take the pawn on c5, that's out. Because I'm going to go queen takes c3, forking king and bishop, bye bye bishop. All of a sudden, it looks that the white bed position now been aggravated. Like it became even worse than before. 
the grandmaster wanting to show is. I've never seen you, you never seen that? Okay. But I see a good port. You do? Well, he didn't play it. No? <laughs> no. He played X Clan. I was going to play Bishop before. Excellent. I mean, this is just fantastic. Now, again, Black is, stu is stuck because having said A, he must say B. If you don't take the, the bishop, I'm just going to take on c5, and otherwise I have no worries. Again, there's no c4, and I'm threatening your knight. Trust me, I'm going to take your knight on f6, be sure of that. So he is kind of rolling with the punches now. He took here, white took here, and black has one move in this position. He has an only move in this position, because guess what? I'm about to go queen d5, lesson in geometry. Queen d5 attacking the rook. If you do something about the rook, I'm going to go queen g5. And you're going to have a little a bit of a headache of what to do about the mate here. So fantastic. What does he do? He plays c4, queen d5, as promised, and now queen a5. And black definitely counted on this move. Again, this is Ricard Retti, a, a famous player and composer. He's not a potter. He knows what he's doing. And he maybe counted on this move to save himself. However, Alexander saw, Alexander Aljokhin saw a little further. What is the purpose of this move? Now, if queen g5, <coughs> water break. If queen g5, threatening what seemingly is an unavoidable mate, black is calmly playing check, king h1, queen takes f6, and white can just go to lunch because he's busted. Alternatively, if you take my rook, I have another idea, I'm gonna go queen b6 check, king h1, and if you remember from previous variations, bishop b7, trapping the queen, forcing you to give the queen for the rook. After which, again, my bishop on the long diagonal, this bishop is dead, and I'm happier than anything. So what to do now is white. Now it looks like white is a bit stuck, because his bishop here, well, how to say gently, is in trouble. He plays f takes g7. A very intelligent move. Now you can already understand that, well, the king is a bit unsafe, and in the variations mentioned before, for example, queen takes a8, queen b6 check, king h1, bishop b7 is not that good anymore, because f8 has a bit of an issue. So, queen b6 check, that's necessary, king h1, king takes g7, eliminating the pawn. Of course, the check was important, so there's not going to be any queen checks and surprises, now the queen can block. Now what to do? Again, every move seems like black is just refuting white's very desperate and heroic attempt not to lose his bishop. Now Aljokin simply played after good calculations, bishop takes c4. The bishop is coming out so rudely. How? By just taking that pawn. Now it becomes evident. He just didn't take the bishop. He played bishop b7. The game ended in a draw. We're going to go over it very, very quickly, just for the record. But the point was that if pawn takes bishop, I can now take here, bishop b7, and now the b-file is already open because I sacked my bishop, bishop rook b1. Take my queen, I'll take your queen. Sack your queen for a rook, and I'm going to sack my queen for a rook with check. And in all situations, black is just very unhappy. He's down in exchange for nothing. So he knew not to take the bishop, but then of course the bishop on c4 is just alive after bishop b7. He played check, queen blocks, bishop d3, and white survived this. The game ended in a draw, but not before black had to work a little bit. There was a rook ending that ended in a draw. That's not so interesting, and I want to make sure that we show you two more things that I want to show. But again, if you look at the starting position, it looks like a good move seems like resigning here. You know, or at least planning to resign. And instead he makes a move, and all of a sudden black has to go through a bunch of hurdles to go to a pawn down ending that he managed to hold. Okay. Now we will see a whole game as opposed to a position. And he is playing here a very formidable opponent, one of the best American players of all time, known as the American Fox, Frank Marshall. Anybody that knows the Marshall Gambit, the Marshall attack, is, that's his invention. Very aggressive player. Always hunting for the king, always attacking, always initiative. And watch what he does to him. Now, the opening is a bit funny, because both players are playing very provocative, and both were not very well known for good opening play. 
but then watch the originality of the plan in the early middle game. So, d4, d5, c4. Okay, already on move two, black plays a move that's considered to be dubious because you want to do something with your pawn. Either you accept the gambit, or if not, you hold the gambit with the pawn. So you insist on having a pawn on d5 whenever it's traded. Okay, here he took, takes. And now again, white played a move that's not the best. Of course, the move that looks the best is e4, and that's what he played, but no. You need to play the move knight f3, and I'll explain in a second why. The move knight f3 simply wins a tempo. You'll play some move, like there's some games with knight f3, e6, then e4. Your knight has to move again. If after knight f3, you will play a move like, let's say, bishop f5, try to stop e4, then I'm going to go here. Very unpleasant. Already I'm tickling the pawn on b7, gaining a good tempo with my queen, urging you to provoke a weakness. And it's very unpleasant. So white gains a tempo regardless. But in the game, he played a bit too casually with e4, knight f6. Now we have a position that's kind of very similar from the queen's gambit except the motifs. I'm intending to attack the pawn on e5. When you push e5, or rather, well, if you play e5, knight d5 is just like I, I've conquered the d5 square, just like in the spirit of the variation in the queen's gambit accepted. If you play knight c3, I'm going to go e5. Immediately strike. If you go now d5, bishop c5 is just great for black. And if you accept the pawn, queen d1. And now, if knight takes d1, knight takes e4. Okay, that's just an even trade. King takes d1, knight g4. And I'm attacking the pawn on f2, and I'm attacking the pawn on e5. Regaining my pawn, white lost the right to castle. Yeah, not great. So, you play bishop d3. And very true to nature, e5. Excellent. The best answer, the most aggressive answer. If you don't do that, I'm just going to play knight f3, knight c3, bishop f4, castle, and white has a center that just roams. So this is a great shot. You must accept it. If you go d5, again, bishop c5, black is just developing freely. That's great. So, takes knight to g4. Black is regaining the pawn with a totally fine position. Knight f3, have to defend the pawn. Knight c6. Again, setting a little bit of a trap in this position. And in this position, after some thinking, Aljochen played the move bishop g5. Notice that if he would have tried to kept, keep the pawn with bishop f4, he would have faced the move knight b4. That is really unpleasant. This move is like, whoa, that's really what to do now. <coughs> the bishop on, C, on d3 is attacked, and everything is attacked. You really have to be careful. Um, if you go king e2, I'm going to take twice on d3, and then knight takes here, forking the king and rook. That's terrible. If you go bishop c2, I'm going to go queen takes d1, or bishop e2, queen takes d1. And now, if you go king takes, I take here. If you go, sorry. If you go bishop takes, I'm going to go knight d3 check, forking king and bishop. Disaster, like di immediately a disaster. This is how sly Marshall was. But OK, Ayakin was not a baby boy. He knew that uh, this is not going to happen. Bishop g5, bishop e7, trades, and trades. Now, knight c3. Knight takes e5. Probably a little safer would have been to take with the other knight. But anyways, it's not too late after knight takes knight to take with the knight. He decided to take in true to style with his queen. So this is our starting position. We saw the opening. Both sides didn't impress. And now, in this position, of course, knight take on e5 would have been more simple. He took with the queen, so preventing white from castling. And again, in this position, you think to yourself, OK, white to move. What would you have done? When I'm showing this position to my students, I never ever get the right plan because, well, it's pretty tricky. Everybody comes up with the first move. This knight cannot be tolerated. The knight on g4 is a real pain, you know where. So the knight goes back to f6. Very nice. But now what? I tell them, okay, why to move? Come up with a plan. I can tell you the plan that I see most often is castling, king h1, 
and to play f4, etc. Well, I can tell you that by the time you do that, black is not going to wait for you. He's going to also castle, put a rook on d8, and get tons of counterplay. The black queen can then be chased to, to chase to either d4 or c5, and black is just very much in the game. So what to do? What can be done? Again, notice that the black king hasn't committed itself. And now white is thinking like this. Well, if the black king, sorry? Yeah, you could. No, you're not missing anything. It's just going to be a check on d4 anyways. Okay. Just to avoid a check. So it's just a, it's just a transposition. Not a big deal. But in this position, he thought like this. This, I'm going to try to guide you to the plan. He says, OK, if black is going to castle kingside, I have h, g, f, e pawns, like just the Mongol army just up the board. So that's very appetizing. If you go to the queen side, I better have something ready. So it's very unappetizing for black to castle kingside, because white is just going to go with his pawns up. So, but black is going to play bishop d7, maybe bishop c6 or something, and castle long. Bishop d7, castle long. So what to do against it? How to play against it? Watch what he did. He plays queen d2. OK, at first a little mysterious move. Some might say, OK, maybe he wants to castle long. Very nice. And true, by the way. It has to that part of the plan. So black plays the flexible move, bishop d7. Marshall fully understands that if he castles kingside immediately, he's going to get spanked. So now he wants to castle queenside. So Ayokin says, nope. Now we understand what's going on. The queen is centralized. f4 is coming anyways. And the pawn on a7 is being tickled and massaged. So casting long, queen takes a7, game over at once. Now, Marshall probably was already a bit uncomfortable because he's not used to being in a position where he's the one running around looking for plans. And he played the move bishop c6, I think. Um, probably the move queen a5 would have been more challenging. That would have been a more interesting move in this position. But OK, we can already see that white has complete success in his plan. I mean, I can play, for example, maybe a3, b4. The queen is not happy to be on the queen side, even if he castles. So like, for example, let's say a3. And if you cast along b4, and what, you're going to play queen b6. Already something went a little wrong for black. But probably the lesser evil, because when he played bishop c6, he played castle long, castle. Already he's becoming scared, because f4 is coming anyways. So compromised. But now watch how the game plays itself. Like, if you look at the typical position of castling on opposite sides as a race, and you say, wow, the white king is still kind of on c1, closer to the center, no pawn on c2, and the black king looks safe. Watch, take an etching of this picture, of this position in your mind, and compare it to what happens in just a series of moves. OK, f4, that was easy. Now, where to go to? If you try to be aggressive, you lose a pawn. So let's see it. Queen to a5, e5, and if knight d5, the aggressive move, Simply takes, takes, check, takes, check, and queen takes d5. Going into a beautiful ending up a pawn, like really promising ending with four against two. And of course, nothing is going to happen on the queen side because my king is standing there. Not, not nice. So he went queen e6. So e5, naturally. And for the moment, the knight doesn't really have to move, but eventually it will. So rook f8, rook hg1. All the reserves are ready to play. Now, rook a d8 would have been another possibility. Rook a d8 was played. If knight d7, then g4. <coughs> I'm already threatening stuff like bishop f5, or at the right time, f5, and just horrible position. So we can see just by optically looking that white is just on the verge of winning. So he tries to bring the last piece into the game. However, white continues without relief. f5, queen e7, queen g5. <coughs> Look at the difference. Nothing happened to the white king. In the series of a bunch of moves, the pawns have advanced to f5 and e5, part of it with a gain of time. 
And now the queen is on g5. Of course, I'm threatening to take the knight on f6. The, the knight has to move. So knight d5, the most aggressive response. Now, I'm sure all of you think that white is not going to trade queens when he's attacking. f6. Well, I have one move. Queen f8. I don't feel like getting mated, nor do I want to lose my queen. So, bishop c4. Again, this takes a little calculation because you have to be accurate, but it's already over. After bishop c4, you can just resign immediately. Um, other moves, maybe he could have played knight e4 or something like that, but then maybe knight b4. But he just plays very accurately. Here, attacking the knight and controlling a very important diagonal, knight takes c3. Maybe he was hoping for b takes c3, queen a3 check. Also, doesn't look too scary, but he's giving him absolutely no chances. Rook takes d8, luring the rook to the other rook to d8. Rook takes d8, no problem. F takes g7. Now I'm attacking the queen and the rook on d8, so the queen cannot recapture on g7. He tries knight a2 check. That knight is gone anyways, so might as well sack it. And of course, if bishop takes a2, then I gain a very important tempo. Queen c5 check, and my rook is going to move. This completely interferes with white's plan. So, simply king b1. Now he played queen to e8. Okay, now every move wins. Bishop takes f7 wins for sure. He decided to play e6. Threatening e f7. So he played bishop e4 check. Again, trying to mess things up a little bit. White said, nope. Needless to say that king takes knight, queen a4 checkmate would have been very disappointing here. Yeah? So here, f5. Well, other variations, just for the record. Takes, takes, you got to take, take, you got to take, check. Losing the whole house. Now you lose the bishop on top, and white just wins with a very easy ending. Not even an endgame. I'll take with my rook, and you're going to lose everything. So he played f5, e7 check the natural move, rook d5, and now came a move that in my opinion was a bit sadistic. Of course you can just go rook takes e4, hard to argue with that, and bishop takes d5. Don't know what he would have done even after, maybe he would just resign. But maybe Ayoki thought that with the next move he won't resign. So he plays queen f6. The idea is queen f8 with checkmate. Okay, now resigning would have been good also, but he decided to play one more move, queen f7. Again, a position where every move wins. You can take on f7 and on e4. You can take on e4 on d5 immediately. He just did check and resigns. Of course, after queen takes, check and mate. A beautiful assault by white. If you think again, think of who playing with the black pieces, somebody who's famous for having games like this as white then there's really reasons to be impressed. Really a masterpiece by Jorgen. Even though the opening was not impressive, the way he comes up with a plan in a simplistic position, he comes up with an imaginary plan. How to prevent my opponent from casting queenside, luring into the side where all my pawns can advance. And again, not exactly, the player with black is not exactly someone that can be accused of being uncautious. Knew exactly what's going to happen, but couldn't really stop it. Our last example for the day, we still have time, right? Yeah. Our last example for the day is his famous game, against Yates. This is just a, a lopsided game. Yates is not playing a great game, but still, the guy is one of the, a, a strong master, a really, maybe IM level, maybe GM level. And watch what he does to him, especially the final idea is just brilliant. Just so aesthetically beautiful. So, we are playing right into a Queen's Gambit, normal line, knight d7, okay. Nowadays, Many other lines are popular, especially h6, bishop h4, knight e4, the Lasker, or h6, bishop a4, b6, Tartakover, very, very common. Okay, this is also a move. Rook c1, c6, queen c2, rook e8. Again, I'm not here to analyze the opening. I, Black could have done better than what he does. Bishop d3, okay. Takes, takes. 
knight d5, trying to release from the pin. Again, kind of a standard maneuver in the queen's gambit. But watch what happens in this specific position. Knight e4, okay, f5. Well, very, very ambitious. Probably a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction trying to punish white's play. I think that this is just not, not very good. Bishop e7, queen e7, knight d2. Now you see that there's a problem. The bishop on c8, well, doesn't have any moves. And now e5 is not going to be so easy to execute. d5 is, is, is going to be an isolated pawn in some positions. Not an easy position to play already. I think that black done basically irreversible damage. But it only gets worse. b5. I don't know what he was thinking about. I really don't understand this move because if the bishop would have retreated, maybe I can understand. But of course he's going to take, obviously. Because you can take with a C pawn, with an E pawn, because I'll take on C6. So you must take like this. And now bishop C8 is really, really out of play. And I'm kind of ready on the C file. So, bad idea. Castles, A5. Now, if black gets to play the move A4 here, maybe he's going to have something. Knight B6, Knight C4, maybe he's going to have something. Not a whole lot. But white is just in time. Here, here, bam. The knight jumps rubbed into c5. And again, I'm trading the pieces already. You can see that if I get to trade knights, which happened in the game, I can't believe he allowed it. I would have played any move but allowed the trade. Knight b6, knight f6. I don't know. I, I know that white will play knight e5 and have a huge advantage. But I will somehow pray that somehow at some point, maybe I have a chance to do something. As it turned out, he played here, 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 thinking that by relieving some of the uh, material is going to have relief, but no. The C5 combined with the, the better minor piece, but watch how he does it. Watch how he wins this game beautifully. B4, unimpressed, doubling. Bishop comes out. The knight jumps in. Maybe black had ideas to play bishop C4 here, disconnecting the rooks and attacking the A pawn, then rook to the C file, challenging the rook. He says, nope, not today. Now c4 is super controlled. Rook b8, f3, no rush, b3, a3. Yeah, whatever pawn he would push, he would push the other. Just closing the position there so the rook can just operate freely on the c file. h6, again, hard to criticize a move when there's no hope. King f2, king h7, h4, rook f8. King g3, just in case he had ideas to play f4 here. So no. He's just marking time. He waits to see what happens. Rook c7, bishop here. Rook c5, back. Rook c6, has to go back to defend the pawn. And king f4. All the pieces are participating in this task. King back, h5. Step by step, he's tightening the screws, and black is just dying. Bishop f1, no gifts. Bishop back. And now, just avoiding the last little trap, maybe you want to double rooks on the seventh rank. So where do you go? Can't go here, can't go here, can't go here, can't take. And it's either d7 or f7. Now, f7 feels a little uncomfortable, maybe, because the knight is holding it, but it's the best move. If you play rook d7, bishop b5, skews you unpleasantly. So, rook f7, king h7. Maybe the last chance was to play rook f8, but I'm going to win the pawn on e6, and not nice. So here, to defend the g7 pawn after here, here. Now he played knight to d7. Idea, knight f6 check, winning an exchange because of the pin. When the king moves to h8, still, Knight f6. So Yates played rook f8. Okay, at first maybe you think, well, he tricked him. Now you have to trade rooks and then the knight has to retreat. No. He simply took on g7. He took the knight because mate is threatened on h7. King e5. Resigns. Why? Because the rook cannot be defended. 
if you move the rook back to the only safe square or defend it on the only safe square, I'm going to go check and mate. So the combination of a mating threat and the rook, you have to lose material. And of course, in this position, it's just curtain. Did you have a question? I just wanted to say king e5. Yeah. Yeah, this position appears a lot, by the way. In this position, like a winning combination, you see it in many books. Takes, takes, king e5. Very nice. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the, the games of Alyokin. I suggest that you will uh, take a look at his, uh, um, how do you call it, two-volume two, two best games of Alexander Alyokin. There's tons of great games here. And if you want to get better, it's really a good book to, uh, to look at, to analyze. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.